So instead of feeling anxiety, I'm anticipating what's next instead of disassociating because he delivered me from that. And instead, I'm going to a space with him to find quiet time to hear his voice. Has your life, your dreams been interrupted? Good news. It is possible to reinvent our lives. People are doing it every day. And some are brave enough to share the struggles, disappointments, and challenges. If you are looking for a new beginning, a do-over, or to rediscover your passion, maybe even find a new one, then grab a cup of coffee and let's talk. Interrupted, Act 2, Reinventing Your Legacy, with your host, Coach Lori. You are hearing stories from people whose lives have been interrupted, and yet, They're using their stories to help others. Have you ever thought of using your story to help others by writing a book or creating a podcast? Well, then you're in the right place. Go to www.coachlaurie.com for all the details. Rita Renee Davis is our guest. She's an author of Leaving the Lie. She also has a ministry called Revive All. Welcome, Rita. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm actually very excited about this. I knew these things were coming and it's been really nice meeting new people through this process. So thank you so much for having me on. Let's start as we always do with about your life now and all the things you're doing and what you love about your life. Yes, the exciting part first. (laughs) What I love about my life, I am married. And this is a big deal. I have five kids, two that are adopted. So I have a 25-year-old, a 23-year-old, a 21-year-old old, a 19 year old and a seven year old. So there's a story in that too. I love, love, love being 50 and going through the process of caring for a seven year old while I have grown adult children. That's a whole journey. And I love that I'm in ministry. I love that the Lord is guiding me obediently through the hearts of his people. I love love. Compassion and mercy are one of my greatest attributes, and I love that part about my life. You talk about something you do every Friday that sounds really fascinating. We were going to start our Friday nights about praying for our city and praying for a lot of the survivors that Cody and I work with. Cody is my husband. And so we showed up to just bring in the presence of the Spirit through worship, and reading of the word. And it was just us. And then slowly but surely, people started coming in. We're all range of people, all ages. There's people that come with mental health issues, people who are homeless, people who are addicts and actively trying to get out or work on their lives. And then we have people who know us through church that show up and we provide a space for everybody to have a platform. You don't have to be perfect and you don't have to have it all together for the Lord to use you. It's become such a beautiful and sweet community of people. And you're also a life coach. More of a like a guidance coach. I worked in psychiatry. I worked in crisis. I worked as an advocate for domestic violence survivors. And I took all of those things and I combined it into a life coaching ministry or business to provide a space for people who are out of trauma. So it's a trauma informed who have sought the help of counselors who have gone through program and treatment. I walk with them through what it looks like outside in the new you. How do I confront the new business in the new me? How do I confront people and relationships now that I'm out of trauma and I'm walking new? I love to provide a space for them to navigate their new, redeemed, restored, healthy, and what it looks like to become a part of society again and belonging. I love that because I see so many people that have trauma, they haven't got help or they didn't get the kind of help 
that's trauma informed and they're muddling, they're treading water. They're not getting success. They're not getting movement in their life. Kind of their mindset is, well, I tried that. And yet what I love and what drew me to you, I can't hardly wait to talk about your book. We can have a life after trauma and it doesn't have to be treading water. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Lord. Your book is called Leaving the Lie. So I'm guessing you're going to take us back and tell us what brought you to where you are now. I started out with wanting to write books. I knew that I was supposed to write books. This gets really emotional for me. I was in the middle of like two or three different books. I was stuck and I was out gardening one day and I'm pulling all of these weeds. The Lord comes and counters me and I'm frustrated. I'm actually bleeding. I'm just super frustrated with the amount of weeds. And all of a sudden these weeds became significant to the people whose lives have been through trauma. It felt so daunting. And I was like, Lord, what are we going to do? I had this moment in the garden where I was brought to a place that with him and through him, my life had been delivered and healed. And I looked down and the weeds were hardly there. They were coming with ease at this point. So I realized that it wasn't without him that we could do it, but in him and through him that it came with ease and it wasn't as daunting as it seemed. And he whispered to me, leave the lie. And then I knew like, this is the book that I'm supposed to write. It's my life story. Maybe, just maybe, if it changes one life, that's all that matters. I did not choose this book. I would not have chosen this book, which is why I was probably stuck in writing mode. No one wants to share all of their life story. For one, a lot of us don't. The other part is no one wants to walk through the trauma all over again. You leave it behind. And some places you haven't even opened up. When you write, you have to go through every sense. You have to bring the reader into a place of understanding and relatability. So I had to walk and sense and move through things all over again, even healed, even having been delivered. It was hard. It was one of the most vulnerable and hard experiences. I suggest almost anyone and everyone share their story. It doesn't have to be written in a book. It needs to be spoken about if the Lord has brought you through something the testimony of who he is comes to life. And through writing the book and through that experience, I realized the trauma of my life that I've gone through, it was minuscule in comparison to the memories that I had. So those moments happened to my life, but the greater scale of my life, because I'm 50 now, is that I had fun and laughter and good memories. And the Lord was always there. And I had friendships. Once I got that out and on the table, I was able to look at my life as a whole and say, wow, I had a great life. That trauma really took over. That is leaving the lie. I added a part of the book that is teaching. It provides a teaching, a walking your own journey out, and some questions to ask yourself. I don't provide my testimony of truth. I want them to find their own journey of truth through the relatability of the trauma that I went through. I love what you said about telling your story because it is so traumatic if we don't reface it, which seems so scary, but it's not as scary as the initial trauma that we went through. Thank goodness I have a team of people that surround me, empower me, encourage me, and walk me through, not triggers, because I don't have triggers anymore. I am free of PTSD, but there are pieces that are brought to the surface that are a little agitating and you do need someone with you to walk through maybe some doubt. I did go through a lot of doubt in writing the story. Maybe my story isn't as big as someone else's. I never thought that I would actually say that because as even a life coach, we come in tune with everybody's story is very valuable to them. It's really important. Every emotion that they go through is very similar, even though the story could be bigger on one end or smaller on another. But we're all feeling and experiencing the same God-given emotion. 
emotion. When I went through doubt, it was like, whoa, (laughs) what is this? This is the enemy trying to keep me from writing a story right now. I'm really proud of myself for writing that book. And I want to continue to say that over and over. When people came to me and celebrated the launch of my book on Amazon, I was exhausted. I just wanted to sleep. I slept two days. And then I woke back up and I said, okay, I'm ready to celebrate me. While people are celebrating, you have spoken of your story, written your story. There is a piece in you that has to rest in the fact that you took that brave step. Not all things are a happy, joyful celebration, but you can sit in the celebration that I did it. I finished it, and sometimes it's okay to rest and not have to be present for other people in the celebration. What's really important is when we are brave enough, because it does take courage to share our story, if one person says, oh, she made it, I can make it, it feels very minimal, but yet I often say to people, What if your story is the answer to someone's prayer? Yeah, exactly. Please, please share your stories. The first brave step that we take, the very first brave step, I even write that in the book. Walking in truth is the second part of the book. And the very first chapter of walking in your truth, the very first brave step is forgiveness. So there's an entire forgiveness walk that you go through. And then from there, you start to walk out, am I worthy? Am I qualified? And am I seen? All these things, all these lies that have come to you or me or anyone that has gone through trauma. Specifically, those are the chapters and the lies that I spoke of. I was not seen. I was not believed. The very first chapter out of the gate is sexual trauma from a teacher. I don't, I don't even wait. The Lord just brought me right into it. I was not believed in that time. I didn't believe myself. I didn't even know if it happened because I didn't have recollection. And then from there, all the lies start to spiral. It's not any one person's fault, least of all yours. It is a journey that you go through in and through trauma. The greatest step, the bravest step you can take is forgiveness with yourself, with others, and then tell your story. You're safe to tell your story in forgiveness. That's a big walk. Can you say a little more about not being believed? Yeah, I have no recollection of it. The incident, I had a before the the incident or the sexual trauma and then after. And I knew that there was something in between there. And I couldn't place it. And I was young. You know, I was in junior high. And I was a very Pollyanna junior high. I came, I'm 50. So we're walking back in the years during that time. There was a lot of innocence that looks unique to what a lot of young girls might go through today. I was exposed to very little. The maturity level was not that high either to articulate even my mindset at the time. I had a disassociative, which I can label now, which I didn't understand then. I call the space in the book. And so that provided an an unknown place too. Do I believe myself? Do I believe my own mind? My parents recognized that something had happened because they knew me. They called the school. There was some things that happened. And then there was very little that happened from there. So they have this diagnosis, still even today, that if you have a loss of memory or you can't claim something, it's not really a reality. Have a definition and a diagnosis over something that I had felt very real. So now I disconnected myself from medical or mental health. All the way around, I was kind of lost in believing myself, believing other people, believing in 
mental health, everything and everyone situationally just lost me. And so I pushed it away and the safe space became a dual personality. I don't want to put that into a mental health term. I did not have split personalities. I did not have a schizophrenia. I had no psychosis. It just was me, this other being that I created. That other being kept me safe. So whether I believed it or not, I just was going to move in that other space. Yeah, I love it that you talk about that. So what was the linchpin? What brought you to where you recognized that was happening and then you began to get the healing? There were a couple of moments, and I write about this in the book, so I'll I'll just kind of leave them with a little note. You're going to have to buy the book to hear the rest. But the little bit is one particular moment that I had Uh, sitting at the table with some mutual school friends and we were grown up and we were adults. There was a discussion that popped up about this particular teacher. And the question was that somebody else in particular had something happen. Did it happen? Was it happening? And as the story was coming to light at the table, I wanted to retreat to my safe space. And I pulled myself back into the conversation because I did not want to miss the truth. And when I did that, I spouted out a question to like keep the conversation going. I was humiliated And so I said, somebody else. I blamed it on somebody else. My answer was in the form of, we believe that there was other victims. So in that space, I started to realize that I might have really genuinely been sexually abused. And still, even with that knowledge, I shoved it back, began to to keep the dialogue that kept me safe all along. I don't know if it happened. And then the second part was that I ran into him on the street and my body reacted in a way that was not safe. And I was fighting with all of these sort of spaces that I had created, the disassociation, to come back because I wanted everything to like be in that moment and find out, is this real? Is this real? And all I did, my only response was, I know what you did. And he looked at me like, who are you? What is this? And then went on. So that left me still questioning, what did I just do? And there's a piece of me that protected him too. Like, what if this isn't real? And he's a teacher and he's married and he has kids. Then what kind of person would I be to start relaying all of these crazy insinuations over him? And he was loved. He was really, really loved in the community. I did not want to isolate myself because I already felt that at such a detriment in my life that I did not want further isolation. So after that happened, I love this because it just shows how we are as people. You wanted to like almost give him the benefit of the doubt, but then you know what you know. It's a war. It's a war going on. So what was your next step? What finally got you to to the place where you could know what you knew to be true? And that's also in the book too. One part is my youngest sister ended up in his class. I went to war for her. I didn't want to figure it out. I did. I came to my parents. I said, Hey, remember this little time? Yes, we do. Well, let's do something about it. I'm not going to go to this school. So what I did was we pulled her out of the class. I believe I went to the police and said, this has been years later. I don't know if this is true, but I want to make a report so that if anyone comes forward, you have this report sitting here and this will back it up. So at that point, the moment that I filed the report and stepped forward for my life, my whole body's getting excited right now because that I'm, I'm in that. I remember there was a moment in just writing the report that said, you know what? This happened. It happened. No one goes from where I was at to this level of pain, disassociation, 
trauma. I'm older now, so I'm figuring all that stuff out. No one goes from living the life I lived to that unless you have other mental health diagnoses that bring you there. But I don't. I'm a normal, quote unquote, human being. There's no mental health issues. I have no, nothing else that would state but this. I do write about a moment too what that walk home was from not knowing how I got there. I would encourage people to read the book and to find out more about that if they have ever suffered from disassociation in any way. We can, as people having gone through trauma, have our own individual ways to deal with it, but we all collectively can relate to stories in one way or another in little pieces. And my hope is that me opening up and being brave and bold to share what I still don't know to be true to help someone else. And I did change names. It was really brave because there's many people still in my life who may or may not know who I'm writing about. I do know that something happened. You are so brave. And going to the police, what you said about you're feeling like you're disassociating, I think that that's not talked about. I think some people don't actually know what's happening to them, but they check out. So Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything you want to say around that, but I think that was really powerful. The book, Leaving the Lie, has multiple trauma. You would never think that a woman, like the woman that you're talking to right now, could have gone through all the things I did, but it led me to a turn of events. Not only was I sexually abused, I have been homeless. I have been an addict. I had an eating disorder. I had an abusive husband. There's just so much that I travel through openly and honestly through. During every single one of those chapters and everything that I went through, just association in one form or another because it starts to manifest and change itself in accordance with what I'm doing. If I'm using drugs, it's going to look different. If I'm inebriated on alcohol, if I'm having sex with a partner that is not made for me because I'm abusing my own body, the disassociation during sex looks different. I made sure to talk about that all throughout the chapters in such a way that even I've been free specifically for four years, mostly two, even while I'm working, even while I'm healthy. And I want to reiterate that to every person. I'm healthy. I'm delivered. I am free, restored, redeemed. I still struggled with a disassociation. And that is okay. I can still provide wisdom, guidance, and be in the Lord and still work on this part of me. It's nothing wrong with me. It was a place that created a safety, a strength. I believe that God gave me a space. Some people have all memories and can stay present because the Lord knew them and what they were going through. Some people need to pack it away and then bring it out when it's ready and provide help. With all of that said, it looked different with every single event that I went through, mostly to provide a safety net in most of my poor choices, most of them, or the ones that came at me. It is statistically true that once you have been hurt, sexual trauma, you will have more trauma come at you. You're looking at yourself like, oh man, I'm, what's wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with you. There's just something that keeps coming at you because your body, your mind, and your soul have provided the only tools that they know until or when God encounters you. And I talk a lot about one of the most important things is where was God? What if? This is a huge part. What if? Where was he? Why did he? This whole line of questioning when you go through these things. And the answer that I have, I do actually have an answer for that. It's not what if, saying doubt. It's because he loved me that I am redeemed and none of that matters anymore. 
It's because he loves me and promised me miraculous healing and promises you miraculous healing. It's because of that that I am healed. There's times and journeys and spaces that he did not want these things to happen to you. There's free will and bad people. But because it happened to me, he will restore, renew, and create a mighty path. And that's where we start the story and the healing. I'm a coach I, and I teach people to become recovery coaches. And I say, ask a different question. One of the things that I say right off the bat is it's not my, I don't take possession of my diagnosis. I don't take possession of my abuser. We change that language right out of the bat. And I do talk about that in the book as well. It's it's not I struggled with. I don't take ownership of anything. I am not my anxiety, not my disassociation or my abuser. I struggle with because in saying I struggle with means God's still going to redeem and heal me from. And he has. Amen. Anxiety actually in a healing place, in a, in a whole and healed place turns to anticipation. We change the language. Language is very important to me. I stopped going to Wikipedia. I'm a writer. So I love words. I love definition. I went right into the Bible and said, what's your definition? You're the originator of language and, and my body. What does this look like? I feel anxiety all the time. Now I'm redeemed, renewed, and what I think is supposed to feel like anxiety is not true over me because you restore me. So what is it? Oh, it's anticipation. So instead of feeling anxiety, I'm anticipating what's next. Instead of disassociating, I'm not disassociating anymore because he delivered me from that. And instead, I'm going to a space with him to find quiet time to hear his voice. So I'm not saying, oh, I'm disassociating. I'm not triggered anymore. Trigger is to spark new. Oh, Lord, I'm feeling something I don't like right now. And I know you are the author of my life. So what are you sparking new? Not, I'm triggered, I'm shutting down. If somebody wants to get your book, Amazon, Leaving the Lie by Rita Renee Davis. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do you have brain fog? Are you exhausted all the time? Do you struggle with depression? How about cravings? Imagine an enzyme that turns sugar into fiber. For a link to order your bottle, email me at lawcoach at comcast.net. That's L-A-C-O-A-C-H at comcast.net. Three things we learned from Rita. We do not have to take ownership of our diagnosis or our abuser. We can turn anxiety into anticipation. We don't have to live the lie. We can leave the lie. If you love this podcast, here's a big ask. Will you share with your friends and family, subscribe, give us a review, and a five-star rating so that others looking to reinvent their lives will be able to get the help they're looking for. Thank you in advance.